this talk to our member in KMUTT and welcome other people too. Okay, so um, let me, um, I, I wanna go to something that I uh, left open uh, last time. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about it, uh, recently and uh, so let's let's go here okay so uh here so if you remember uh i showed you that uh these two sets are hyperconvex huh h1 and H2. You hear me, guys, right? Yes? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. But oh. your screen is not working well, I think. I and mean, now? Right now. Okay, 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 now it's fine. So uh, let me uh, uh, go to this point because I didn't uh, clarify it. So H1 and H2 are hyperconvex, okay? Why? Because they are the retract of the disk, okay, which is uh, a hyperconvex, okay? I'm talking about R2 with the soup norm. Now, uh, if you look at the intersection, you have these two points, uh, the top one, this one, and this one, okay? And two points will not be hyperconvex. It's disconnected, and we know that hyperconvex are convex metrically convex okay great so now let's look at these two points okay and let's call them uh let me call them a and b oh no because i used a okay let's call them m and n M and N. Okay, so uh, if you look at uh, the set uh, C equals M and N, it's not hyperconvex. Okay, so if we look at H, oh, 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 oh that's A. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's A. Okay, I have to. So this is the set I'm talking about, this one here, 0, 1, and 0, minus 1. And I left it, what is H of A, okay? What is H of A, which is uh, a minimal hyperconvex, which contains A. And uh, it's not unique, as we said, because the, you don't have, like, the case of convex sets. The intersection of convex set is convex, and therefore you have the convex hull of a set, which is the intersection of all the convex set that contains it. In the case of hyperconvex, we have to be a uh, little bit careful because the intersection of two hyperconvex may not be hyperconvex. But we showed through the work of Vaillant, okay, that, and the use of zone lemma, that there are minimal hyperconvex which contains a set A, minimal. So uh, the question was, what is H of A? Uh, if I take these two points, what is H of A? And in fact, if you look at A, now this is what I wanted to show you. L let's look at A as a subset of H1, okay? And let's look at now H of A in H1. Okay, in other words, the minimal hyperconvex which contains a in H1, okay? And what's interesting, look at now, let me take a different, focus on H1, only here. Okay? So what is the middle point? 
So now let me take a different color. So what is the middle point of M and N? It's this point. Okay? And uh, in fact, if you take any, uh, the segment, in other words, the metric segment between M and N, we should be in H of A because H of A is metrically convex. So you prove that the metric segment is this one. And therefore, uh, H of A is exactly H1. So, okay. But if you look at it in terms of H2, you will see that uh, the minimal hyper, uh, a minimal hyperconvex which contains A in H2 is H2, same argument. And therefore, H1 and H2 are both minimal hyperconvex, which contains the two points. It's interesting, huh? So here is an example where uh, the hyperconvex hall, uh, you have more than one. Huh? You have more than one. In this case, you have two of them. I was thinking about it afterward, okay? So uh, let me just recall something. Uh, because maybe some people are not aware uh, quickly. Let me just, for the sake of argument, huh? Okay? So, what did we say? We said that you are hyperconvex if uh, the distance for, for any uh, family of balls, center X alpha, radius R alpha, family, huh? Such that the distance between x alpha and x beta is less than r alpha plus r beta for any alpha and beta, then the intersection of all these balls is not empty. This is the fundamental difference, uh, definition of hyperconvex metric spaces, okay? So uh, from here, let me show you. So uh, let x and y be in M, the hyperconvex, huh? and take uh, T in 0, 1. Okay? So we have the distance of X to Y, which is equal to T plus 1 minus T distance from X to Y. Uh, and therefore, the ball of radius x t of dxy intersect the ball of y 1 minus t dxy is not empty uh, by hyperconvexity. And if you take z in here, then we have the distance from x to z less or equal than t xy. And the distance from y to z less or equal than 1 minus t, the distance from x to y. Okay? And it's not very hard to see, in fact, uh, because the sum is equal to dxy by triangle inequality, that in fact you have equality. Okay? t of dxy. And the distance from y to z is 1 minus t of the x1. So this is what's known as metric convexity, huh? as metric convexity. The classical metric convexity. It mimics a little bit the case of uh, linear convexity. Huh? So uh, that's why, um, okay? So that's, that's, um, that's, I wanted just to, to clarify the points. Interesting, this uh, problem, uh, as I said last time, uh, in general, okay, uh, you take M, any metric space and you can embed it isometrically into L infinity of M, okay? So you can see it as a subset of L infinity of M, which is hyperconvex. And therefore, you can always define H of M, the uh, hyperconvex envelope of M in L infinity of M. Okay, and the, the, we have it by Don Lema and by Bayons and so on and so forth. But the problem is uh, they exist 
a minimal element. So they do exist, okay? Uh, they do exist. The problem is uh, how to find H of M is totally different from the conv of M in the linear case, okay? The envelope, the convex envelope of a set, uh, we have a clear description of what it is. In the case of hyperconvex envelope, we don't know. But as I said before, if you remember, Isbell, okay, is the one who gave us one uh, example, one uh, minimal uh, hyperconvex uh, envelope of M, one. He built it, okay? He constructed, and I gave you the reference in my previous talk, okay? Great, so let's let's stop. There is, uh, there is a lot more to be said about uh, hyperconvex. As I said before, if you take the metric trees by itself will be uh, an amazing uh, an amazing uh, example, which is this cat kappa kappa negative four or kappa negative. Okay, so these metric trees are a wonderful example of hyperconvex, and uh, there are some beautiful work done uh, on this. Uh, I did also work on this. It was uh, Kirk did a lot of work on this, by the way. Anyway, so let's let's go go now and start um, the last talk, which is um, uh, on uh, fixed point theory uh, in hyperconvex metric spaces. And by the way, th th this this fixed point theory is what brought us into the subject. That's what brought me into the subject. Okay. Uh, as I said last time, uh, Bayon, uh, who, whom I consider, by the way, uh, as a person who has the most beautiful theorem in this area, the famous intersection uh, property I told you last time, uh, is the one who initiated me to hyperconvex when I was a student. So uh, he asked me some questions, and uh, uh, so I got interested into hyperconvex in the 80s, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of work on hyperconvex uh, was done also by by people in fixed point theory, uh, but it looks like that uh, it's a hard subject and therefore people uh, did not pursue it. We, and this hyperconvexity has some beautiful applications in different areas. Okay, so let's go to um, we talked about this. Okay, and before, uh, let me just uh, state this uh, because it's really interesting how uh, this uh, problem, okay, or fixed point problem, in fact, uh, does not, um, people, they look at it from a different uh, angle, okay? Is that when you look at this statement, let X be a set, so now, now the talk is about the fixed point property. Huh? Okay. Yeah, it is in hyperconvex, but uh, I will teach you something about some beautiful ideas about the fixed point problem and fixed point property. So anyway, so X is a set, and A is a non-empty subset of X, and you have T that goes from A to A, uh, and you want to have a, a point X such that T of X is equal to X. Okay. So such X will be called the fixed point of T, and it may or it may not exist, okay? Uh, you may a little bit relax the condition that T is a self-map of A. So as you can see, if you look at this, this uh, it has nothing, it, it doesn't tell us anything about X, okay? So uh, X can be any set, any abstract set has, as well as A, okay. So the 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 the, the question is uh, under what conditions under what conditions uh, this T has a fixed point, okay. In other words, this equation T of X equal X has a solution, okay. Good. Um, if you remember your course on uh, differential equations uh, using power series, okay? Differential equations is using power series. So we have a differential equation and we have a solution, 
and uh, we look at uh, the solution. Uh, uh, sometimes, of course, you have some powerful theorems that tells you that there exists a solution, and sometimes you don't care, and uh, you just develop it into a power series, and you try to find the coefficients of the power series. So you see, uh, what we are doing is uh, looking at the equation, at the equation, per se, and working with it. In other words, it's like, for example, if I give you a quadratic equation and you try to solve it, okay? So here is the same, t of x equal x. Uh, we don't look at under what conditions it has a solution, okay? But sometimes we just try to work with the equation itself and see how, what can be said about x, for example, okay? So, so that's why I started uh, recently, in fact, to not look at the general problem, which is uh, for any t, uh, you have a fixed point. In other words, a more general theorem. No, I started to focus a little bit on the equation itself, to differentiate between the fixed point problem and the fixed point equation. Okay, and uh, uh, that's why I introduced this new idea about uh, the fixed point equation. A uh, little bit is known uh, and corrections to be made. Uh, I'm thinking about the work of Alkashi uh, around 1400 when uh, the historians, they thought that he was doing uh, the Banach contraction principle and in fact he was not. What he was doing is playing with this, as I said, the example of the first equation, he was looking at the equation, and he was not looking at a general theorem that gives him uh, a solution, okay? So anyway, so let's move on. The fixed point theory has three branches, okay? We have the topological one, the metric one, and the discrete one, okay? Keep in mind that I didn't say anything about x, okay? Uh, so X can be topological space, can be a metric space, it, it can be a partially ordered set, for example, or a graph, okay? And uh, these three sub-theories of fixed point theory, uh, they developed uh, after the publications of three main theorems, okay? The first one is the Brewer fixed point theorem, okay? The second one is the Banach contraction principle, and the other one is Tarski fixed point theorem. Okay, so the first one is Banach, then Brewer, and then Tarski. Okay, so Tarski is the case of discrete sets. Okay, uh, I'm 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 not gonna work on uh, on uh, the um, Banach. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna work on uh, the Brewer nor Tarski, but I will keep them uh, in case I need something. Uh, or adapt something. But the main focus in this talk will be about the Banach fixed point theorem, okay? I'm sorry, the metric fixed point theorem. Sorry, sorry, the metric fixed point theorem. Okay, so uh, 1922, Banach publishing his thesis, uh, the, uh, the famous Banach contraction principle that uses the Lipschitz mappings, okay? So there is the definition of what is the Lipschitz mapping. And if k is less than one, you have a contraction. If k is equal to one, you have a non-expensive map. I mean, uh, I know when I was a student in France, contraction is reserved to the case. Uh, I'm sorry, some, some people, they use the contraction for k equal one as well. I, I have seen slight, uh, uh, slight uh, difference from one, one person to another one. As long as when you are writing your paper, your thesis, whatever, or your book, whatever you are writing, as long as you start with this and you tell people uh, what happened when k is less than one, what's the name, and k equals one, what's the name, that's fine, don't worry about it, okay? Uh, so here is the theorem, the famous theorem that says that if you have a contraction with a constant k, then the orbits, okay, all the orbits, they converge and their limit is unique, all of them, not the, the limit is unique, we know that but it's independent of the starting point, okay? It's independent starting point. 
and they do converge at the limit because t is continuous is a fixed point so you have a unique fixed point okay and all the orbits they converge to it and you can start with any x okay so uh, and you have this kind of uh, approximation that tells you for example that if you take t and x for omega you are committing an error which is less than this number here that depends on k um I wanted to say something here is that you can use this uh, in, in the case of um, uh, some abstract metric spaces. Like, for example, what happens when you take uh, MD, which is a complete metric space, and you take uh, bounded subsets of M? Uh, let's make it bounded just to, to, to simplify our lives and look at the case of uh, all the non-empty subsets, closed subsets of M. So M is a is a, a bounded metric space, and you look at all the subsets of M, okay, non-empty. So they are of course all bounded, and you take the Hausdorff distance, okay, between the subsets. Then you generate uh, a, a metric space, okay. So from from the metric space itself, you generate another metric space, and uh, since you have a metric space, you can look at contents and you can apply this theorem. So this theorem uh, should be seen, the beauty of this theorem is the fact that M is an abstract matrix space. In other words, it was known, this theorem before, but it was known in specific cases, especially the people who are working in differential equations, okay? But the beauty of, uh, or uh, the, uh, what's made Banach contraction principle a famous theorem is this abstract formulation. Okay, and uh, this can be used, for example, to explain some phenomena in geometry, what's known as fractal fractals or fractal geometry. You can understand this, and an example of that is the counter set. Is is the counter set is an example of uh, a fixed point uh, of an application of this Banach contraction principle, and uh, since it is we're looking at the classical. Uh, the classical um, um, counter set, uh, which is defined on zero one. So your M here would be the interval zero one, which is a bounded uh, metric space. Okay, and from there you can show that applying this theorem will give us the counter set. Okay, the famous counter set. But of course, it's just an example where this theorem can be applied to fractals and fractal geometry, okay? So you have to see it this way. And I, I believe I told you before and when I visited uh, uh, when I visited Bangkok that uh, another example, a recent one, of course, which was really amazing is in uh, uh, logic programming and artificial intelligence. Uh, it was a uh, fitting computer scientist who uh, the people, they did not understand something that was happening with some programs, okay? Um, basically, it was after countable uh, compilation of something, we end up having our model or the solution and uh, things works just fine. And they didn't understand why, why it happened uh, in a countable fashion. And it was fitting who, uh, I have this paper, by the way, if you're interested, who told them that uh, what's happening is, is basically an application of the Banach contraction principle. So, so it's really uh, the power behind this theorem is the fact that we should look at it from an abstract point of view. Okay, an abstract point of view. Okay, so uh, what happened when k is equal to one? Okay, what happened when k is equal to one? So in this case, t is no longer a contraction, and it becomes non-expensive. And the case of non-expensive, it's it's really complicated. So in other words, though the theorem is very simple for contraction, for non-expensive is very complicated, extremely complicated. Okay, and uh, uh, it, it fails. It's, it's very very simple to build on the unit circle an isometry or rotation that we keep going, or and it doesn't have a fixed point. And the reason it doesn't have the fixed point because the fixed point of the uh, isometry or the rotation 
is the center of the circle, which is not on the circle, uh, the center of the disk. Um, so in 1965, uh, people used, uh, uh, it's, it's really amazing, in fact, uh, without going to too much in details from a historical point of view, but you have uh, basically four theorems, uh, three main results. Um, the Browder result, uh, there are two of them, one in Hilbert, and then after he saw good, uh, good uh, uh, paper, he went back and he revised it, and uh, he gave us then the same conclusion as good, which is that uh, a uniformly convex Banach space, and if you take uh, a bounded closed convex subset, uh, then T, any non-expensive mapping will have fixed point. Kirk, it's a different approach, totally different approach. Um, and it's more general, okay? It's more general. Uh, uh, Kirk, uh, uh, I, I believe I told you that when I talked about Kaskapa and Metro trees, uh, it's a geometer. When he started, uh, he did his PhD in geometry. Uh, so it has nothing to do with fixed point property, okay? And he was looking at this paper by Brodsky and Minman, uh, where uh, they show uh, that if you take uh, a convex set in the Hilbert, uh, then there is a point, okay, uh, the Chebyshev point or Chebyshev center, that is fixed by all the isometries. And it's really interesting because all isometries, they have one fixed point. So he was interested in two this uh, this uh, work by Brodsky and Milman, of course, Brodsky and Milman did not just do it in Hilbert, okay? So they saw it in the Hilbert, but they proved it in uh, uh, met uh, in all Banach spaces, which enjoy a property uh, known as the normal structure property. So the normal structure property was uh, introduced by Brodsky and Milman in this paper in 1948, okay? And what's interesting is the fact that it was written in Russian, and Kirk does not know Russian, okay? So, uh, uh, I always make a joke here saying that uh, I'm glad that he didn't know Russian, because if he knew Russian, we would be in deep trouble. Uh, let me explain why. Um, the fact that he did not know Russian, he wanted to. Uh, uh, by, by the way, by the way, what I'm I'm telling you right now, this is Kirk uh, story, not me. Uh, we had a, a drink in Chile in uh, a few years back, and I asked him this question: What is the idea behind this uh, fundamental theorem, 1965? And that's where he told me the whole story. Okay. So anyway, so. Uh, since he doesn't know Russian, so what he did, uh, he said, okay, who cares? Let's just, uh, uh, I don't know whether you have done that before or not. I, uh, take a Russian paper, you don't care about the blah, 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 but you go just over the mat, okay? So uh, he tried, he really tried. He couldn't uh, find anybody uh, around him that understood Russian right away. And we're talking about 1964, 1965, 64. So guys, like now you have this uh, fancy translators, Google translators and others that can translate for you. Uh, in his time, it wasn't. And uh, so he struggled. And he tried to redo it on his own, okay? So he couldn't understand. He was trying to read the math and try to come up with the proof and understand it. Uh, by just looking at the mat without the text, and he couldn't. So finally, he sat down and he looked at the mat and he helped himself a little bit, and he proved this famous result that, in fact, he doesn't care anymore about the isometry if the map is just non-expensive. So you don't need really an isometry if you have, but you don't have the uniqueness of that point. In other words, uh, it's not common, it's dependent. So, it, so let me uh, tell you, so uh, what's going on here? So we have uniformly convex Banach spaces are reflexive. Closed bound convex cells are weakly 
compact, then you have some kind of compactness in the air, okay? So uh, let's assume that we are weakly compact. You don't have to be in uniformly convex. We can have reflexive Banach spaces without being uniformly convex, okay? So uh, let's assume that C is a non, uh, weakly uh, compact, convex, subs of a Banach space X, non-empty, of course, and T, which is a non-expensive. This is the, the setting for the, uh, the, 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 the famous fixed point problem in Banach spaces. This is the setting, the classical one, of course, huh? classical one. So you have C, which is a weakly compact convex subset of a base X, and you have T, which is a non-expensive mapping, and you are looking at whether T has a fixed point, huh? whether T has a fixed point. Okay, so uh, what is the approach, okay? So the approach is, uh, of course, as I said, sorry, as I said, if you look at Browder and uh, Good, they have a constructive proof when X is uniformly convex. Okay, a constructive proof. Okay. That follows the ideas, of course, of OPL and others, okay? Uh, like Ishikawa and so on. And so. But anyway, uh, because they, they, they try to, to capture some of the ideas uh, hidden in the Banner contraction principle, basically the orbit. Okay? So uh, let's continue with uh, Kirk because the approach of Kirk is totally different. Okay, So the approach is to look at uh, C, since we have this weak compactness, we can take by Don Lema uh, a minimal uh, convex set which is invariance by T. So you, you look at the family of all the invariant subsets, convex, closed convex subset non-empty of C, uh, and you look at by uh, zone lemma, in other words, you satisfy uh, the condition of zone that any chain has a, a, lower, um, a lower element, and uh, um, you prove then that you have the existence of minimal by compactness, uh, minimal non empty convex. So the, the question becomes what are the properties of K? If if uh, T has a fixed point, assume that T has a fixed point. You have a general th th theorem that tells you that T has a fixed point. Then that mini set has to be a singleton, just one point. Okay? So you see, uh, if you don't have a fixed point, if T fails to have fixed point, then K is not reduced to uh, a singleton. So K has more than one point. If K has more than one point, the diameter of K is positive, non equal to zero. So you see, this, the, the, all the, the work uh, that came after Kirk, they go this way, okay? They go this way. Anyway, uh, so let's... Uh, so the standard question is how to secure that the minimal convex subset is reduced to one point. If K is reduced to one point, then we are okay. Okay? So basically, uh, what are the properties, what are the properties of this uh, uh, convex uh, minimal subset? Okay. So here, uh, just for the sake of, uh, for the sake of, there are uh, very little that's known about this uh, minimal convex sets, okay? Invariant under T. And this, this, what you see here in this, very limited, very limited. So first is what Kirk told us in his 1965 paper, okay? Good. Little bit, little bit, honestly, little bit, okay? Basically, that's K is diametral set. Okay, fine. And... Uh, we had to wait almost like 10 years or a little bit more to see Karlovich uh, come up and say uh, that uh, it has another property, okay? Uh, of course, uh, uh, Goebel, uh, I gave him credit for it. Uh, for many years, we have been talking about Karlovich, 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 and uh, Goebel explained to me that, in fact, he did discover the same property of that minimal set, and he published it in the Eastern, uh, at that time from Poland, 
the some of the work has to be published in some of these Eastern journals, uh, and he published it in a very obscure journal there in Eastern Europe, and it wasn't known. And since then, uh, when he told me this story, uh, I started to put in all my writing, uh, Goebel Karlovich uh, lemma or result, and now it's known as Goebel Karlovich property. Okay, it was uh, funny because uh, the Goebel paper appeared almost on same time in the 70s and we had to wait till the big revolution of uh, Moray uh, using the ultra power techniques uh, to see some more results basically what Lin discovered of the superpower of uh, a minimal convex set so it's, it's very very interesting anyway so so basically very little I, I believe me when I say little very little if we know more about this minimal invariant set then we will get more results on these non-expensive mappings, okay? And there are so many of them that are still open. Okay, so let's start with what Kirk discovered. What is it that he discovered, okay? So this is the, the first property discovered by Kirk. First, the minimality uh, uh, gives you the convex, uh, the closed convex uh, hull of T of K of the image is K. In other words, the T of K generates the whole set k it's very simple to prove by the way huh? very very simple to prove it's just uh, what you do you show that this set is invariant it's included in k because t of k is in k and the conv uh, is in k because k is closed convex and therefore this is a subset okay and you show that this one is invariant by minimality they must be equal so it's very simple no big deal and this one, uh, this one needs some work, okay? And uh, let me explain what it means here, property number two. Because property number two has something to do with Brodsky and Milman. But anyway, you can prove it. Huh? We can prove that, in fact, so let me, I think, uh, hold on, hold on. Let me uh, see. Uh, to explain two, I need to explain two, because you have to... Uh, No, it's coming later. So let, 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 let me just explain something here. So here we are. So you have a convex set. And uh, of course, be careful because you will not see it because you are in the uh, Euclidean plane and therefore it doesn't work, what I'm going to be saying. Okay, it doesn't work. So, but let, let me show you something. So every time you take, uh, take uh, the, the circle, uh, the circle can give you uh, a picture of what I'm saying. Yeah. So uh, the diameter here of the circle in this case is two. I'm taking a unit circle, for example. And if you take any point and you look at the supremum of all the distances, huh? okay, any point x, and you look at the distance from x to any point. Okay, and you take the supremum, this will give you two because you have the uh, this point here. Okay, the distance is two, and therefore it's less than two. We know that, and it's equal to two. Okay, so here uh, the supremum of the distance from x to y for any y in the set is equal to the diameter of the set. Okay, for any x. In the set okay so uh, if you go now to understand what some of the stuff if you take now any set a and you take a point in the set okay let's say here X and um, let's see if I can erase yeah so uh, what, what in, in the normal Euclidean geometry huh? so what is that that point here uh, is gonna be uh, right here the farthest point the supremum the farthest point is right here and therefore you see if you look at now take the circle centered in x with radius this distance it will contain a and in fact is the smallest radius well, see the smallest radius centered of the ball centered in X, which contains A, okay? They have a name, it's called the Chebyshev radius, 
okay, at X. There are two of them. There is what's known as the inside uh, Chebyshev radius and the outside Chebyshev radius. But basically, that's what it means. Huh? So it has a geometric interpretation, okay? Okay. <clears throat> So here, <clears throat> what, what does it say? It says that uh, you have this two, okay? This property two. And uh, the Chebyshev radius, it means the Chebyshev radius at X is equal to the diameter. And this is the definition of what's known as diameter point, okay? A diameter point, meaning that every element of K is a diameter point. So we call K a diameter set, okay? Great, so this was discovered by Kirk. And the Brodsky and Milman property, or the normal structure property, forbids two. Okay? By the way, you need property one to prove property two. Huh? Okay, you need it. Without one, you cannot get it. So, uh, that's it. So, you have Brodsky and Milman, the property, which is the normal structure property, tells you you cannot have more than one point and be diametral. You need to have a non diameter point. Okay, uh, so uh, you see it right here. This is the normal structure property. The definition tells you that uh, if you have a set with more than one point, okay, the diameter is positive, more than one point, it, con it contains a non diameter point, x0, which means that the Chebyshev radius is less than the diameter. Okay, so if you have the uh, a weakly compact convex subset. And if you have the normal structure property, for sure, 100%, you have a fixed point. This is 1965 paper of Kirk, okay? And uh, it's amazing why, because uniformly convex and Hilbert spaces, they all enjoy the uh, normal structure property, okay? And therefore, uh, uh, the, the theorem of Browder and Good of 1965 are a special case of Kirk's theorem, okay? So, uh, Kirk's theorem took over, and the people looked at this theorem as the theorem, and they start working on this metric fixed point theory uh, from, so 1965 all the way to 1979, 80, uh, mostly the people were interested into the normal structure property. So the normal structure property was central at that time, to the people working in metric fixed point theory. It's it's really the center. And uh, if you if you look at, for example, the work of Takahashi during this time, right after 1965, is how to prove this theorem in the case of uh, of uh, metric spaces, nonlinear metric spaces. So, so the people start to look at, for example, how can we adapt? Because most of the properties here are metric in nature, okay? Are metric in nature. Okay, so uh, let's continue. Yeah, this is uh, uh, meaning that the people they taught at one time uh, during this period of 65 to uh, uh, the 60s and 70s that uh, in fact, fixed point property only happens if you have normal structure property. Uh, so that's what they thought. Uh, they thought that uh, uh, <clears throat> some people asked this question. And not only that, uh, they even thought that uh, <clears throat> any reflexive Banach space has the normal structure property. Yeah, because all the examples, uh, they were either reflexive or super reflexive. And uh, of course, it was uh, James uh, in 1972 who took the little l2, renormed it, and he showed them that you may not have the normal structure property. Yeah. And then, of course, Bayon discovered that it has something called a symptotic normal structure property. And uh, but it kept it kept going. Okay, it kept going. Uh, the, the real break happens at the end of the 70s, early 80s. That's where things started to take a different route. Uh, and by the way, still a lot is unknown. These are hard questions. I mean, as you can see, uh, the Kirk fixed point theorem, it took uh, what? It took uh, uh, almost 40 years, 42 years to get something, 43, to get it going. 
but still uh, little is very uh, known uh, in this area. I'm talking about profound questions. I'm not talking about this artificial stuff that the people are doing in terms of generalization here, generalization there, okay? So now, uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, what's his name? Takahashi uh, was looking at the uh, uh, Kirk theorem um, in uh, metric spaces. So the people wanted to uh, look at this theorem and see whether it's the validity of this theorem in uh, metric spaces. So let's, let's look at now the theorem. I, I want just you to pay attention. Let's look at it. I want to... Um, we want to go beyond the statement here, okay? Okay, so let me see how I can use my, uh, my, 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 uh, my pen. Okay. I have been off for quite some time, guys, that's why. Okay, so let me use the blue one. Uh, so what do we have? We have the normal structure property. The normal structure property is definitely metric. Now remember, do you have the uh, radius and uh, you want to say that there is less than the diameter, non-diameter point and all this stuff. So it's metric, okay, period. Okay, so where are we now? We don't want Banach, yes? Because we want to go into metric space. And we have C, which is non-empty, weakly compact and convex. So in fact, we have two properties. We have convexity and the weak compactness. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Takahashi did work on, okay? So he looked at in a famous paper uh, that uh, convexity, he looked at something called the metric convexity or the people are calling the W W uh, lambda x y map, this W map. So it's just to capture the convexity, okay? And for the weak compactness, uh, what Takahashi did, he just used the normal compactness, okay? The normal compactness. Of course, it's too strong. Uh, it has a merit because uh, you, you are looking at now Kirk's theorem in a different setting, a linear setting, a nonlinear setting. And uh, uh, the problem with that is that when you go back to Banach spaces, you want to, whatever you do, uh, whatever you do, if you go back to Banach spaces, you want to discover this theorem. You don't want to discover something that has a weaker assumptions. So it means it's not a good extension, okay? And that's the problem with the, that uh, version of Takahashi extension to Kirk's theorem, to metric spaces. The problem was the fact that he assumed compactness for the distance, which means that when you go to uh, Banach spaces, what you have now is C, which is compact. And if C is compact, convex subset, and T is non-expensive, in fact, T is continuous, is enough. You don't need uh, to have non-expensive behavior because we have Brewer fixed point theorem. Okay? So anyway, so let's continue now. Uh, So, uh, oh, here is the, the paper by Takahashi, huh? 1970, huh? okay? So, for me, anyway, uh, the best formulation uh, is this paper by Penault that appeared in 1977. It's really uh, amazing. Uh, it's amazing, in, 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 truly amazing, okay? So, what did Penault do? do and uh, so this is what he did he said okay let's start sorry about this uh, so uh, let's start with what is convexity okay so the approach taken by Takahashi is a linear convexity, huh? meaning that uh, if you have uh, x and y, yes, then you have something like 
alpha x or minus alpha y. Uh, it's an abstract, it's an element such that the distance from x to z is equal to 1 minus alpha dxy and distance from y to z equal alpha dxy. Okay? So uh, this is just an abstract notation. Remember that he called it alpha x y what's his name uh, takashi okay mm -hmm. so uh, many people looked at the metric convexity and if you're looking at iterations you have no choice than to do this what perno did he looked at it from a set theoretical point of view set theoretical point of view so he said uh, let's consider a concept called convexity structures okay so what is the what are the minimal property satisfied by convex set is that the intersection of convex set is convex. So he said uh, a family of subsets of M is a convex structure if the empty set is there, M is there, and S is closed under arbitrary what? Intersection. This should remind you a little bit of topology, huh, right? That's how we define a topology by looking either at the open sets or the closed sets. So for the open sets, you have the intersection, uh, I'm sorry, the union of open sets is open, but the finite intersection of open sets is open. Here you don't have that. You only have one property, which is that uh, intersection of convex sets is convex. Okay, so it's an abstract formulation. So you have two uh, definitions. One via this metric convexity or segments. Okay, and here via an abstract formulation okay by the way the people are working in economics uh i have a book uh that uh, these convexity structures they play a role in uh, uh, economics as well as in uh, for example some optimization problems so it, it's a concept that is uh, uh very profound it's not just for the sake of uh in any case so this is the convexity that was introduced by Pinot. okay Sorry. Uh, so uh, we have now the convexity. What about compactness? Weak compactness. Remember, we have compactness and convexity in C. The non-expensive mapping T is easy, as well as the normal structure property. Okay, that's not a problem huh? because it's metric. Okay. So what happened? Now we have convexity. He captured it to the convex structures, and for the uh, Compactness, he used the, the topological definition of compactness, okay? So, of course, what is the fundamental difference between this and uh, Takashi? Takashi, when he assumed compactness for the distance, the compactness, the strong topological compactness, okay, he did it for all the closed subsets of M, I mean, the set, the domain of the map T, okay? And here, no, you have this family s it doesn't define all the the sub closed subset of m the family of all closed subsets of m is a convexity structure but it's too large so you can make it smaller and then you assume the same definition as the normal compactness in this case meaning that for any family of element of s okay if you have the finite intersections are non empty, then the total intersection is not empty. I mean, the normal uh, definition of compactness. So we will say that S is compact, okay? S is compact. So a convexity structure is compact. Um, okay. Now, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, what is one of the assumptions that you assume, uh, but by the way, the convex structure has nothing to do with M being a metric space, as you can see. I'm not using, M is just an abstract set, so M can be a discrete set, 
Okay, very important. M is just an abstract term. So we are going to look at it in the case of a metric space, but it doesn't have to be. Huh? It does not have to be. Okay, now what is Penault in his formulation of Kick's theorem? He said, uh, I'm assuming that the balls, the closed balls, are uh, convex. In other words, they belong to S. So he looked at a family S, he added one more property that the balls are in S. Okay? So if you have the balls in S, uh, you have the intersection of balls. And the intersection of balls, of course, non empty uh, intersections, uh, because you, you have already the empty set, that's why. So you have what's known as the admissible sets. What is an admissible set? Is an intersection of balls. Is an intersection of balls. In fact, the ad set of admissible sets is a convexity structure okay because if you take uh, an intersection of an intersection of balls you get a huge family of balls and you're just doing their intersections so it is stable by intersection and therefore uh, uh, the uh, family of admissible sets which is uh, this one here that's how we call them a of m then it's also a convexity structure okay and it's, it's smaller okay Okay, Kirk's theorem. Okay, so now we're ready to to have. Uh, uh, so Peno, he has what now? Uh, so here is the compactness. That's what I told you. Uh, remember, you have the finite intersection property. Then you have the total intersection, which is non-empty. So by the way, this this compactness captured the weak compactness. How? Because we have a characterization in the case of Banach spaces that if the co closed convex sets they satisfy this this property then the the big set is weakly compact so it characterizes the weak compactness not the normal uh, uh the normal in the case of convex subset if you do cl uh, the intersection for closed subset you get compactness the topological compactness but if you go for the closed convex sets you get weak compactness uh, it's a little bit tricky uh, you need to know your little bit uh, foundations of Banach spaces, okay? Uh, so where are we now? Uh, the, this is just what? The uh, normal structure property in this case, which is the radius, the Chebyshev radius, diameter point, non-diameter point, etc., etc. okay? So here is the theorem. Now we're ready. So I see he gave us all the foundations. He said, so take MD, which is what? A non-empty bound uh, metric space. You have a convex structure which is compact and normal. Then every non-expansive map has a fixed point. This exactly captures uh, Kirk's theorem. Of course, when you go to Banach spaces, what is the convexity structures? These are all because the domain will be uh, a weakly compact convex subset. I'm talking about the Kirk's theorem, and therefore the uh, the um, uh, family, the convex family, will be the closed convex subsets, the closed convex subsets, okay? That's what, what it's gonna be. So uh, if you have normal structure property, uh, the classical one. So th this this version of Pernod captures exactly the theorem of Kirk, okay? Uh, it's really a beautiful one. Uh, and I believe it was 77, huh? That's what we said, okay? Okay, so now, uh, um, so let me give you an example. Okay, it's very, very important. Uh, if you look at the example of little and infinity, okay, uh, let me, I want to explain this. This is, this, th this brings us to, um, yes, hold on. So let's look at now little and infinity, okay, what happened in this case. A uh, little infinity, it fails the normal structure property. Okay, great. But if I take now the family of admissible subsets, okay, then uh, it has the normal structure property. Okay, and uh, not only that, it's also compact because 
admissible subset. Huh? It's compact because infinity is the dual of little l1. And therefore, the balls uh, are uh, weak star compact. And therefore, you can use weak star compactness to show that this family is compact. Okay? So this family has uh, the normal structure property and is compact. Therefore, of course, you don't have an infinity. It's not because it's unbounded. But if you take any C, which is an admissible subset, okay? And you take T, which goes from C to C, then you have fixed point, non-expensive. Okay? So in other words, the theorem of Kirk and the Penrose formulation works in this case, meaning that uh, admissible subset of an infinity or balls, in fact, any ball. If you take T, uh, C as a ball, then if you take any ball, okay, in L infinity, and you take T, which is non expensive, okay, self map of the ball, it has a fixed point. This was unknown. You couldn't capture this by, by uh, the previous. Uh, 1965 uh, theorems or the knowledge that was done before. We couldn't. Why? Because in infinity is a very bad space in terms of geometry. Okay? So the, to, to, to see that the admissible subset of a little in infinity are normal, are, uh, they have the normal property, uh, this is a combination of Penault's work and Kirk, of course. Kirk is the one who looked at this example. But again, I want to take you to the case of uh, uh, 1979, okay? As you can see, there were two papers, okay? Published uh, in 1979, Sign and Swardy, okay? And uh, as you can see there, the theorem, it was Kirk, Kirk who noticed this. Huh? So their, their statement is slightly different than what you see here, but basically they reduced to this, okay? Which is that if you have an admissible subset of a little in infinity, and in a non-expensive map has a fixed point. It's new because it doesn't fit the classical stuff. Uh, the people who worked on the geometry, it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't work. It's really amazing. This here is amazing. So 1979 saw now uh, an explosion, a new direction. Okay, meaning, what is special about L infinity? Uh, L infinity, as we saw in the previous two lectures, is hyperconvex. Therefore, the question becomes, uh, what, uh, what happened? And by the way, admissible subsets are hyperconvex. Intersection balls are hyperconvex. And what's the difference between A and L infinity? They're bounded. So what happened now if we take a bounded hyperconvex matrix space? Okay? So... This uh, uh, now brings us to uh, what's known as uh, the work of, uh, it was Kirk who set it up, uh, and he got people interested into this hyperconvex metric space. It was Kirk who, who told us this, okay? The concept of hyperconvexity existed, as I told you, that was arranged in Panic Spandia, and it was very early on in the 50s and even before. But the point is that Kirk is the one who saw in that two papers by Sine and Swardy that, in fact, his theorem of 1965 can be stated in terms of what? Of hyperconvex metric spaces. So what do we have? We have this R of X, which is the distributive radius, yes? You have R of A, which is the infimum, okay, of all these distributive radiuses, which is known as the distributive radius of the set, delta of A, which is the diameter, and the center, which is uh, the set of x such that the distributive radius of A is equal to the distributive radius at x, okay? So these are geometric properties are well known. It has nothing to do with uh, what's known. In general, huh? in general, we have the triangle inequality, the diameter of the set of... Yes? Are you there? Yes, yes. Am I talking to myself? No, no, we're listening. Ah. Let me know huh, if you want me to stop or something. I'm still almost enjoying. done. <laughs> I'm still enjoying. 
Okay, good. So uh, in general, in general, we have this uh, uh, inequalities, which is that the diameter of A over two is less than the radius, which is less or equal than R of X, which is less or equal than the diameter. Of it's, it's true in any metric space. What's amazing is that the optimal one, which is that delta of A over two, you can reach it in the case of hyperconvex. Ah, now the question becomes, okay, uh, the question becomes, uh, so you, you see it there, if two, uh, if R of X is less or equal than delta of A over two, then we have this inequality, okay? Good, so, which means by the way that X is in the center, okay? In the Chebyshev center of the set. Huh? This is the best case scenario, huh? the best, okay? Okay, so now, pay attention now, okay? I want you to pay attention a little bit. Huh? Uh, let A be hyperconvex bounded source of M, okay? Hyperconvex, huh? And bounded. Then what do we have? For every X, Y in A, we have delta uh, D of X, Y is less or equal than the diameter, which is diameter of A over 2 plus diameter of A over 2. Since A is hyperconvex, then the intersection of this ball centered in X with the radius delta A of 2 is not empty because A is hyperconvex, okay? So now take an element in this intersection. What does it mean? Uh, call it z for example so the distance from x to z is going to be less or equal than delta a over 2 and therefore r of z is less than delta a over 2 and it has to be equal from what we said er, uh, above okay so you see in the case of bounded hyperconvex sets you have the best case scenario okay you have the best case scenario meaning that the chebyshev radius is the diameter over 2 that's that's you cannot beat it Okay, it's amazing. Okay, in the worst case scenario, R of A is equal to delta of A if A is what? Diameter set. Okay, uh, that's the worst case scenario because R of A is between the, the diameter and the diameter over 2. Okay, so uh, now this tells me what? This tells me that the, the uh, hyperconvexity, uh, of course, if you take the admissible subset, uh, you get. Uh, the compactness from the hyperconvexity, and now we have the normal structure. In fact, we don't just have the normal structure, we have what's known as uniform normal structure, because normal structure property tells me that R of X there is this, and X, which is not diameter, which means R of X less than the diameter. Here, no, you have an R of X which is equal to half the diameter. So there is a uniform control of that uh, uh, Chebyshev radius by half, which is amazing. So it's known as the uniform uh, normal structure property. Uniform normal structure property. It has, it's, uh, uh, there is a reason why I insist on this uh, because, uh, so let me, let me take you back here. So the normal structure property tells me what? That uh, R of X less than the diameter of A. Yeah, or whatever. The domain is C if you want. Okay? That's non diameter point. Okay? But th there exists X huh? in C such that. Now, uniform normal structure property tells me there exists an X. Uh, first of all, uh, there exists an alpha less than one. And there exists an X in C. Alpha is independent of C such that R of X is less or equal than alpha delta of C. So alpha, this alpha has to be bigger than one half, okay? So alpha is less than one, but it's bigger than one half. So this alpha here is greater than one half, less than one, okay? In general, it's bigger than one half, okay? For the reasons I just mentioned earlier. What's amazing is that this alpha, the best alpha, the smallest alpha, uh, has some nice applications. So in, in the case of, uh, of uh, Hilbert, uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's one over square root of two, okay? In the case of Hilbert. Okay. So we do have uh, what's known as the, uh, uh, as the um, uniform normal structure property. Yeah? We have normal structure, but we have more. We have uniform normal structure property in the case of Hilbert for closed convex subset, huh? for closed convex subset. Okay, I'm almost done, so let me just wrap it up. Uh, so now, 
this is of course what his name our friend uh, uh, Kirk he published this theorem that if you have H which is uh, a non-empty bounded hyperconvex metric space and you have a non-expensive map then you have fixed point. What's interesting is, so the first one is an existence fixed point. What in fact, you have more. You have that the fixed point set is hyperconvex. Very simple, very simple. You take a bunch of fixed points, uh, you take this intersection of balls, and you show that uh, T will leave them invariant. It's, it's really simple, simple, very simple. That you have more than just the existence of fixed point which tells you that the fixed point set is not empty in fact it is hyperconvex now uh comes bayon this is exactly what he came by on. he said okay so what happened if i take now a family of commutative mappings do i have a common fixed point for this question he discovered that famous theorem the most important and beautiful theorem in what in uh metric fixed point property in hyperconvex in fact in hyperconvex uh, hyperconvexity. Okay. He was motivated by the idea of having a common fixed point. Okay. Uh, at this stage, uh, let me uh, tell you something funny here that happened to me. So when I was a student, what was the question by by young to me to me? So we have H, which is bound uh, hyperconvex subset and you have t which is non-expensive goes from h to h yes uh, non-expensive then you have fixed point okay excellent so this is the theorem i just told you what if classical theory huh? what if we drop bounded and we assume that t has bounded orbit this is true in Banach spaces, okay? This is true in Banach spaces. Huh? If you have uh, the classical weakly compact convex subset and non-expensive map, and you have the fixed point property, then you have it also for bounded orbits. So uh, the, the, the idea of how from an orbit, a bounded orbit, you can build a, a a convex set is, is it's amazing and the, the reason is because the, the the union if you take a union of uh, bigger convex sets uh, their union would be convex okay obviously uh, and then when you close it uh, you get uh, 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 a convex set uh, again if you take uh, cn's convex increasing then the union will be convex and if you close it you will be convex so this here gives us the classical case that you can drop the boundedness of the domain and assume that you have a bounded orbit which is weaker okay so this is when known so Bayon asked this question, he tried, he couldn't do it, and he asked me to prove it, okay? That was the first question that Bayon asked me when I was a student, uh, to prove that, or disprove. So uh, in the last part of my PhD, the last part, I proved it. I proved that uh, if you have a bounded orbit, in other words, if we go back to the theorem, and this, of course, is something I wanted to tell the students who are doing their PhDs, okay? So, in fact, here I don't need, I just need H, which is what, non-empty hyperconvex metric space. I don't need bounded. And T, which is uh, non-expensive with bounded orbits, then the, you have fixed points. Once you have fixed point, then it's easy to show that the set of fixed points is hyperconvex, okay? So I proved it. And, uh, of course, uh the, the 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 idea is based on what i just showed you okay okay th this here okay but i don't have convex sets here i have segments i i played around in other words i throw everything in little and infinity and i'm now working in little and infinity and uh instead of having convex i have segments okay because basically intersection of uh balls are segments and now i have these segments which are growing segments huh 
So uh, the union is a segment, the enclosure is a segment, so it worked, okay? And uh, I defined my PhD and uh, um, some big names were there during the defense. Uh, people like Choquet, for example, in topology, he was there attending my defense. And then uh, we go for a party, okay? At night, we had a nice dinner and we were having fun with uh, Bayon, Brock, and others, and Godfrey, et cetera, et cetera. And then Bayon comes to me and then I mean that proof is not correct. So if you look at my published PhD, uh, the theorem is there. But right there, right there at night, Bayon approached me and he said that statement, that theorem, that exam, I mean that property, this property here for segment in infinity is not is not true. This set may not be a segment. The last one here. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, uh, so of course, uh, I was disappointed, but at the same time, you should look at it from a positive point of view, which is what that the problem is still open. So, I mean, yeah, it's true that uh, the proof I have is not valid, but this does not mean that the end of the world. It just tells you, is it true or is it not true? So, in other words, we're back to square one, okay? So, anyway, so uh, years goes by, I believe, not that much. Hold on, let me see. So uh, look at this paper, 1992, okay? So in this paper, uh, when I was visiting Bob Sign uh, in Rhode Island, and we worked on this, and while we were working on this hyperconvex business, uh, I received a, a message from Proust, who was a Polish mathematician from the school of, uh, of what is named Gebel, okay? So, and he sent me an example uh, that uh, is not true. So, you, if you have a bounded orbit, you may not have a fixed point, okay? You may not have a fixed point. There is the example by Proust, 1992, huh? 1992, okay? So, you take this map T, okay, uh, defined in this fashion, you shift the element, uh, and uh, you take lambda x, which is the uh, Banach limit, or if you want limit over any ultra filter, and uh, you take the orbit of zero. By the way, t is an isometry, and if you take, which is also uh, non expensive, and you take the orbit of a zero, and the orbit of zero is uh, bounded, but it, t fails to have a fixed point. Okay? So this so is really. Very, very interesting example, okay? So we know now that's that's not true. What does it mean? It's not true. What does it mean? It means that uh, 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 the, 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 the hyperconvex uh, property does not behave well like the normal convexity, like the normal fixed point property, okay? So uh, again, as I told you before, uh, this, this is what motivated Bayon to prove his famous... Uh, Theorem. It's is is the fact to prove a common fixed point, a common fixed point. That exactly you want to prove a common fixed point, and he came up with this beautiful uh, intersection property of hyperconvex. Beautiful. So I'm almost done. Uh, let me uh, let's see if I, I yeah. So this is now some open problems. Huh? Uh, so uh, remember the uniform normal structure property. Okay. Uh, so let me, I don't want to tell you many of them. Uh, this is the asymptotic one, uh, asymptotic non-expensive mappings defined on uh, hyperconvex. We don't know whether we have fixed point. What I, I was able to prove is uh, the fact that, let me see if I have it. No, no, this is an open one. It, uh, what I was able to prove is the fact that the infimum of dx tx is zero. In other words, you have approximate fixed point, but I, I'm, I wasn't able to prove the existence of fixed point. So for asymptotic and expensive mappings in the case of bounded hyperconvex sets is an open question, okay? That's one. The next one, uh, which is my favorite, by the way, and this is the last one here, is what's known as uniformly uh, Lipschitzian mappings, which means that 
this constant kn are, you see it right here. You have it right here, the definition of uniformly bounded Lipschitzian mappings. The k here uh, is constant. Huh? You have the same Lipschitz constant for all the tns. Okay? So in the case of Hilbert, if k is less than square root of 2, so we are bigger than 1, of course. Huh? So if k is less than square root of 2, you have fixed point. Okay? In the case of Hilbert. In the case of Banach spaces, uh, we do have a constant k that depends on the space that gives us a fixed point. So in the case of uh, 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 the Banach space setting, there are many positive uh, results in these directions, either geometric, like Goebbels' work with others, or uh, kind of geometric from a different angle, a metric, in fact. Uh, and um, and uh, so my feeling, because it has to do with what's, what's known as the constant of uniform normal structure, okay? That's alpha, that famous alpha, right? So it's one over square root of alpha, by the way, okay? In the Banach space, if you have that famous alpha in the case of, uh, uh, let me see if I have it right here. Um, Okay, so where is alpha? I'm looking at alpha for normal structure property. Yeah? No. Where is alpha? Here. Yeah. So we said that you have the uniform normal structure property, uniform normal structure property, if you have this control, Chebyshev radius at this x is less or equal uh than alpha the diameter okay alpha is less than one so the the problem for uniformly Lipschitzian mappings uh it's associated to one over square root of alpha one over square root of alpha okay so uh since alpha is equal to one half alpha is equal to one half in the case of uh, uh hyper convex metric spaces then I was thinking uh, that the best will be square root of 2, okay, which is the same as Hilbert, okay. So this case uh, is still open, okay. Uh, I believe uh, the constant for the neuron Lipschitz mappings will be less than square root of 2, but I'm not able to prove it. But, and that's but, what you, you can't, but, yeah. you, but you can solve it in the case of metric tree, right? In that, the, right, the, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. Metric trees are really special cases, but not in the general hyperconvex metric spaces. Yes, and this is what I told you about, by the way, um, that it's not empty in the case of asymptotic non-expensive mapping. Yeah, asymptotic non-expensive mapping. I believe, yeah. Yeah, so this is the theorem I told you about that uh, um, we can prove that the infimum is equal to zero. Any question? Uh, there is a question in the, in the chat from Othman Abad. The question is, uh, how about in the case of LP spaces? Uh, and P spaces, uh, so uh, at man, is, is P less than one, bigger than one, equal to one? What do you know about P? Uh, Othman, please, uh, you can ask him yourself. Please explain. Is he is still here? I think he left. Uh, what is the problem with that? Let me. Ah, bigger than one. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, bigger than one. Okay. Uh, uh, there is a reason why I was asking you if it's less than one. Okay. So keep in mind uh, the talk here is about hyperconvex metric spaces. So the only case where you have hyperconvex is when p is equal to infinity. Okay. When p is equal to infinity. If p is not equal to one and is not equal to infinity, uh, I'm sorry, to infinity, 
then LP falls under what's known as uh, the classical Browder and Good uh, uh, fixed point theory, which is uniform convex Banach spaces. Okay. Now, of course, that there are also uh, uh, functional spaces or uh, measurable functional spaces, and they enjoy other properties. But definitely from the point of view that I was mentioning here, uh, P between 1 and infinity, then uh, you have this uniform convexity. And for P equal infinity, then you have the hyperconvexity. Then all what I said falls on these spaces, okay? Right. And uh, I think there, there, there is another result from, I think in the middle of uh, 90s, from, I'm not sure, I think it's from Lim and Tachok Lim and someone else, proving uh, this result in bounded metric space without hyperconvexity, but he assumed another very abstract condition Yes. I, I cannot really uh, remember the detail, but I think there is, there true, is a result. True, 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 definitely, yes. There are uh, variant forms of uh, the normal structure property, something called, I believe, if I'm not wrong, uh, Lin, uh, he introduced, he introduced some amazing, uh, properties, including what's known as closed in the form of structure properties. So closed, no, like almost um, normal structure property. And he proves some nice, beautiful results. Yes. I mean, all these uh, variant forms of, like, uh, there is another one called asymptotic uh, normal structure property, ANS, that was introduced by Bayon and uh, Schoenberg and others. So all this goes back to how to improve on Kirk's theorem, okay? Kirk's theorem. Yep. Anyone else? Any question? Come on. Uh, what's her name? Uh, is the... Uh, thanks, Boom. Is the... Uh, is uh, Supak around? Supak is. Is she around? She's here, but I think her network is not so nice. It's not so good. I can yeah. I can see her name, but. Uh, Tell her. That, uh, oh, she may want. Problem. Yeah, if you talk to her, Parin, tell her she may want to look into these three lectures in the case of uh, the work that she has done before. So hyperconvexity in the setting of what she did before in her PhD, for example. Yeah, Supak is here. I think. Uh, yeah, there are some ideas there. Yeah, there are some ideas. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, it wasn't investigated, by the way. How about an other versions of fixed points, like in the set-valued case? Uh, good question. Uh, very, very minimal. Very minimal. Is it very minimal. <laughs> very minimal. Very minimal. Very minimal. Yeah. The theory itself uh, has uh, some room and some leg to go. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, uh, let's not uh, kid ourselves. Uh, it's it's a very hard area. It's a very hard area. Yeah, it's harder than the normal Bana spaces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I can understand. <laughs> but it's is a very interesting area, and I think it provides a very good um, work around for our our infinity space. Yep. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Any Joy, other how about you? Are there, are there any questions from you? 
Joy mentioned uh, that she is very interested in your in your in the topic before you started the talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Professor Kemsi. But for today, my network is so bad. I think I need to recon consider your video that you record today. Yeah, I recorded it right away. It's as, recorded. As, yeah, uh, as Perrin told you, I, 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 cons I'm very interested in this space, but I, yeah. I know a little bit <laughs> in there. I, 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 I hope I find some something behind. Sure. In your three top T lectures. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Sure. Sure, Joy. <laughs> Yes, any more questions? Okay, so I will send you the link. I I, I recorded this time, uh, Parin, so I will send you the link, okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, there is another question. Sure. Uh, your case uh, in case of people asymptotically non-expensive. Ah, interesting, yes, here. Uh, a very interesting question, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, what did I, I just said? I said that uh, uh, very little. Uh, Omar, Omar is here. Wow. Can you hear me, Omar? Omar. Anyway, so uh, to answer your question, uh, the answer is no. Let me start from the end. The answer is no. And the reason is because uh, uh, it's very hard to work with these hyperconvex metric spaces. Uh, honestly, uh, they're not as easy to deal with like a normal uh, uh, convex subset of a Banach space where you have the structure, the linear structure. This hyperconvexity, though it's an intersection of balls, uh, uh, it's, it's 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 weird. It's different. It's weird. Okay, and that's what I tried uh, to to show you throughout these lectures is that uh, some fundamental differences between hyperconvexity and convexity makes it a little bit. Uh, more complicated to look into this case uh, of hyperconvex metric spaces. But they do have major applications. Uh, uh, remember what I told you uh, about the uh, SNCF distance uh, and others. And beautiful example. And it fits nicely, for example, I, I, I didn't do it here. I could have showed you the Tarski theorem uh, using hyperconvex metric spaces becomes Kirk's theorem. It's amazing. Tarski, yeah which says that any monotone mapping on a partially ordered set, which is complete uh, partially ordered set, uh, any monotone mapping has a fixed point, or other preserving mapping has a fixed point. That theorem is Kirk's theorem. Uh, that, that's, that's blew up my mind when I saw it the first time. I worked on this with, uh, with Pouzet. So uh, though the uh, hyperconvexity is different from convexity, it has some amazing uh, applications, yes, yes. So anyway, to answer you, uh, yes or yes, uh, it's unknown, yeah. So uh, be careful, uh, try it, work on it. Uh, maybe somebody did something remotely, uh, but if it gets complicated quickly, you have to be careful. You really have to be careful, okay? Because otherwise, like, for example, the case of bounded orbit, I know that Bayon worked on it a long time and he couldn't get it going, yeah. You know. Anyway, any other question? The question is, will that be the next talk? <laughs> um, we'll see. We'll see maybe uh, if I talk about abstract complex spaces not metric hyperconvex uh, right 
think I think Pinot is a very interesting mathematician who always or or thinks like this. Convexity maybe. without convexity, calculus without derivatives, and so on, I think. Yeah, maybe metric trees because they are hyperconvex. Yeah, that's a good idea, by the way. Yeah, you are welcome, yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I will do metric trees. Hmm. Ah, that's a good, good subject, yeah, because a, a lot is still missing from, from there. Yeah, maybe, maybe, we'll see. Mm, yeah. Okay, so I will still mark this series as ongoing. So maybe you have another talk or maybe some talks from us, if possible. <laughs> okay. Okay, but don't rush, but I hope that will be next time and it will be on. on. Okay. So, uh, we will stay in touch and uh, I will announce it either through Facebook or uh, through through you guys, okay? Yeah, sure. Uh, Ken Yi. Thanks, Ken Yi, for, for, for joining. Okay, so I think if there's no further questions, let's end today's lecture now. And I have to thank you again, I mean, for yeah, your... You're welcome. Uh, and, uh, also, nice that uh, many people did show up, okay? I'm, I'm glad that many people did show up, okay? <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, guys. I'm glad. Yeah, and we'll stay in touch, okay? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay cool, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. And good morning. Uh, uh, good night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now I have. Oh, to Uma. Stay. Hello. Hello, Dr. Parin. Hey, yeah. Good day. Good day for you. Enjoy your lunch. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I was just uh, back from uh, work now, so I joined late, really. But next time I will uh, try to make it that uh, prompt, inshallah. Yeah, thank you for for the for organizing this a great talk, indeed. Thank you all. Okay. Time you got next. Okay. Thank I'm, you for. Well, yeah, go ahead, and uh, we'll stay in touch. I'm trying to to stop uh, the recording. Okay, 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 so stay in touch. I will uh, leave the meeting now. Okay, go ahead and leave it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Okay, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye, bye-bye, my friend.